Hello everybody, uh, Jonathan Elvidge from Red5. I hope the boot camp sessions are going well. Uh, I can't be here for this one tonight, um, hopefully uh, in Hong Kong, um, but uh, Mel was very keen for me to uh, realize some of my experiences on intellectual property, which is what I hope to do over the next 10 or so minutes. Um, the first point I want to make is that if you have a business or a product that is successful, uh, it will be copied. Uh, it's, in my experience, it always happens. And I've seen it happen in my business several times and in lots of other businesses. So the thing to do is to be prepared for that and take steps very early on as you set up your business to try and uh, do your best to prevent that from happening or to create barriers and restrictions for anybody who wants to copy your business or your idea. And what I want to talk about very briefly uh, today is uh, trademarks, which are important, uh, getting the domain name um, established right at the beginning, and a little bit on patents and design registrations, etc. So uh, let's start with uh, the domain names. A domain name is really important, and it's important to get that established right at the beginning when you are setting up in business. And it could link uh, to the company name, I'd be the same, although it might be tricky because most uh, dictionary terms, in fact all of them will be gone already. Um, and the domain name should be a name that links to the name you call yourself as a business. And uh, sometimes the name of the business falls off the back of the domain name. So you search around on somewhere like GoDaddy for various different domain names that connect well with the business and then find one that works and that might well establish the name of the business itself because it's so tricky to get a domain name to work. So um, my company is called Red5. One of the reasons we called it Red5 was we had access to the domain name red5.co.uk and subsequently got red5.com and that was a driving factor. And this is what people will um, look for when they start searching for you as a business. So it's important to get that established very quickly. Don't set up a business, establish yourself um, with a name and then find that there's absolutely no way you can get the domain name to work because there will be domain names out there and people looking for you might find them instead. Uh, trademarks. Now I'm a massive fan of trademarks and again that should be something you set up um, very early on in your business career. Um, trademarks can be the name of a product or the name of a business. There's a trademark classification, for example, classification 35 for retail services. So Red 5, for example, is trademarked under that classification. And that stops people basically copying your name. Now, the domain name will help because it'd be foolish for anybody to set up a company um, nicking your name, your domain name, because when they're looking for them, they'll find you. Um, but if you combine a good domain name with a trademark, then that is a initial fantastic protection. And there are a few rules about trademarks. It has to be distinctive. It can't be just a word out the dictionary. It can't be descriptive of what you do. Um, it needs to be distinctive in relation to what you are doing as a business. So Red5 is trademarked, I believe, for a software package, but because it's different to what we do, it's not a problem for us. So again, um, you can search very easily for what trademarks exist and when you are setting up in business you'll be searching company names, you'll be searching domain names and you'll be searching trademarks. And if you can get all of those aligned then you are doing brilliantly well protecting yourself in the future from somebody jumping on your brand because the trademark effectively becomes your brand. It's what you stand for as a business. And your brand is going to become, is going to be key as you grow. Whether it's uh, a brand for a service or a business name or a product, it will be potentially where the value is in the business in years to come. So Red5 is trademarked and we've got the domain name and we've got the business name. So that's great for us. And that is now becoming an established brand. And the Red5 brand you will see now in Argos, in Boots, in Selfridges, Hamleys, uh, in our own stores, 
online and uh, it's really important that we have as much control over that branding as possible and we set all of these up very early on and it prevents somebody coming along and calling themselves something similar in order to benefit from all the, the brand we've built up over the years. So trademarks are really important and quite cheap to set up. You can get a trademark in the UK for about uh, 180, 200 pounds. And so you should be looking at that pretty early on. Uh, patents are the other thing worth looking at. Now this would only apply if you have effectively invented something or there is an inventive step in what you are doing. Uh, and then you can apply for a patent bit more expensive I think around about 300 pounds to get the thing going and that that effectively protects that inventive step and that can become very valuable in the future if your product based on that inventive step actually goes on to be successful and it should help uh, stop something being copied although the point I made earlier um, is valid irrespective of whether you have a patent or not, um, you will find there will be somebody who will try and copy what you do. And I want to talk about just a couple of examples of my experience um, of being copied over the years. Uh, many years ago, in 1991, in fact, I set up a company called The Gadget Shop and that went on to become pretty successful. And we had, in the end, 69 stores in the UK. And uh, I remember my business partner when we were in Hong Kong, he was sat by the pool telling somebody how great the company was doing and how amazing it was nobody else had done what we were doing and so on. That guy, as luck would have it, I think he worked for Marks and Spencers at the time, but he left Hong Kong and set up a direct rival to the gadget shop at the time. Um, so uh, be careful who you talk to about the success of what you do. Um, but the problem was he... For us, he set up an exact mirror of the look and feel. And at the time, we had glass cabinets and a center counter and a certain type of product range. And this new company did exactly that, mirrored the exact layout of the store uh, and, and actually nicked a couple of staff as well to give them more information and, uh, and copied what we did. And what I learned from that was is um, if you start to use lawyers, and there's probably a lawyer in this room tonight, um, you've got to be really careful because it can get out of control and very expensive very quickly. And what we did, we thought we had a clear case of passing off where somebody was effectively making themselves look like us to benefit from all the goodwill we had built up over the years. And we were told we had a valid case. And we got an indication of what the costs would be legally to, to basically take that case forward and hopefully win it. And we were told it would be about 20K. And that was a very useful thing to do because if you are embarking down the legal route, get a good feel in writing for the costs that you're likely to incur in taking it to the next stage. Effectively what happened, we were given advice that we could win this case and off we went. And we subsequently became aware that there was never, ever, and I don't think there ever has been a passing off case based on look and feel of a retail format. And when you look around, you can see there are mirrors of retail formats all over the place. If you look at supermarkets, they look the same. If you look at Burger King versus McDonald's, they look the same. And there are millions of examples of this all around the world. And uh, we were given bad advice. And before we knew where we, where we, where we were, we effectively spent about 200,000 pounds on uh, legal costs fighting this. And in the end, Regretfully, we ended up suing our lawyers by getting another firm of lawyers who said it should never have been done. We were given new advice there. This would never have won. And in effect, um, we sued our lawyers and we won that case. Uh, it was on the basis that they had indicated what the cost would be and they were uh, well over and above that. So we effectively got our costs back and we actually did, we settled with the, uh, with the competitor um, who subsequently went out of business anyway. So do be careful about getting involved um, with, with lawyers. They get expensive and get a clear indication on whether you've got a case worth winning and what the costs are to win that. Hopefully you can avoid this by setting things up at the beginning to
to uh, ensure that you've got a better chance of protecting things right from the start. At Red 5 at the moment, we sell something called the Q4 Micro Quadcopter. It is a fantastic product. It's the size of a biscuit and it's, uh, you might have seen me flying it at some of the other sessions. And um, it's a very sophisticated product. Uh, without going into too much detail, it's obviously miniaturized electronics. It is self-stable. It's six axis gyro built in, 2.4 gigahertz remote control. Um, quite a complex piece of kit. Sells for 30 pounds, so it's really affordable. And we sell lots and lots. Uh, the guy we buy it from, we actually buy it from the guy who designed and made it. He's based in China and it comes out of his factory and uh, the company call, is called Husband. And we've worked with him for many years on many products and that's why we got effectively a head start on this product. Um, but like any product that does well or anything that does well, people see this thing selling and it gets knocked off. And if you look at the picture of the Q4 from our website and then compare it with another product that's on the, on the market, uh, this other product, you can see the similarities and it's a direct knockoff. So even something as sophisticated as this with microelectronics um, can be effectively copied. So nothing is safe. Don't think, well, this is too complex for people to copy because it will get copied if it's successful. And generally, the people who copy it think, can I make it cheaper? Can I bring it to the market cheaper? Can I leverage um, a similar look and feel? Um, and um, can I get away with it generally? And in China, people seem to think it's just the normal way of things. I don't think in some cases you even think, you know, I'm doing something wrong here. They just think there's a product selling. Well, we can make it and we can get it to market cheaper. In this case, the manufacturer has got a patent. The patent relates to the way the motors are built into the circuit board construction. And we're about to see whether this can be tested. So he is seeing the copies now coming into the UK market. He also has a big market in America. And he has just started down the line of defending his patents around this. And it'd be interesting to see whether he succeeds or not because the patents are effectively pending, so you may need to fast track them or prove that they will uh, stand uh, the test in a rock solid way in court. And then he'll be going after the coppers in the market and he'll be looking for damages, effectively retro profits lost as a result of the other ones hitting the market and so on. So there is a real example there of two things. One is nothing is too hard to copy. And the other is if you've got a patent or protection in some way, you've got a chance. Now, if he was calling, if the copy was called the same as this one, the Q4, for example, um, then you'd have a trademark issue as well because Q4 is trademarked and it would be effectively passing off as another product. And um, these are the sort of protections that start to really matter when you've got a really successful product. And we expect to sell probably 100,000 of these over a year. So it's, it's significant and um, important to us. So there's a real life example of a, a patent in action. It'll be interesting to see maybe the next time I talk about this, whether this particular factory has been successful. Finally, a couple of other examples of um, IP, or, um, of protecting your idea. One is design rights. I don't know a lot about this, um, but I do know that if you have a design that is unique or distinctive, um, then you have design rights over it and you can register those design rights. So I think they exist if you can prove something was your design. And I think if you actually go as far as registering the design, you get more protection. And then if you are writing music or creating um, some sort of uh, uh, text of some form, writing a book, etc., then you have access to copyright. Um, where you can protect that particular work using copyright. And you hear people talking about copyright infringement in the context of movie scripts, books, music, etc. Uh, I'm not an IP lawyer, so I don't know a huge amount about these, but I do know they're all important and they're all tools available to you. And you should look at them very early on in setting up a business. 
And I would like to point you to one website that is really useful. And it's uh, ipo.gov.uk. And if you go on there, you can look up, look up all these forms of protection. Um, and you can understand how much it costs to set up the protection in the first place and learn an awful lot more about it, as well as searching trademarks and patents and so on and so forth. Um, I, use it to, I use it every day in one form or another to see what's going on uh, and you should use it too. So check it out, it's really useful. Okay, well that's it from me at the moment. I hope that's been useful and not too dry. Um, and um, I hope the rest of the sessions go well and I hope to be back and see you in uh, some of those sessions and the follow-up with the old boots. So I hope your businesses go well and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.